Back in November of 2022, I created a Mario Kart challenge for myself. The task was simple. Beat all of the original Mario Kart 8 Deluxe tracks with the following rules. 1. I had to do them all in order. 2. It had to be all in one go. 3. I had to come in first place in each race against the hardest CPUs. 4. I could not fall off the course, meaning if Lakitu grabbed me with his fishing rod, I lost. And 5. I had to do all of this while racing in 200cc mode. This may sound simple, but going into this challenge, I had only played Mario Kart casually, and the highest I raced was 150cc. 200cc is a whole other beast, requiring the right cart, the right character, full knowledge of the courses, timing, and craziest of all, you need to actually use the brake button. And yet, when I started this challenge, I thought it would take maybe 20 or so attempts. How difficult could a racing game by Nintendo be? In reality, I failed this challenge over 40 times over the course of two months. It gave me quite a bit of insight into 200cc, and I feel more people would be willing to give it a shot if they knew how to start. That is what this video is for. Sup y'all, my name is Scout, and this is a rookie's guide to Mario Kart 8 Deluxe 200cc. Before we get to the tracks, let's go over what you need to race in 200cc. Your character and cart choices are crucial, as it's better to prioritize handling and acceleration over speed if you are new to the game mode. Higher handling reduces how much carts slide and allows racers to take corners tighter. In 200cc, you won't always have the wiggle room to take a wide turn or a skittle over the track. You need to be precise with your path. Higher acceleration is needed since you'll be slowing down to hit certain turns. With high acceleration, you'll come out of these a lot quicker, and it also helps when you're recovering from mistakes. As you gain more experience, you can probably start sacrificing these stats in favor of more speed, but if you're a novice like I was, this should not be a priority. For me, I chose Orange Yoshi as my racer, since very light to medium characters provide the acceleration and handling boosts that novice drivers will be looking for. As for my cart, I had to mess around with my customization early on, but eventually, I unlocked the Biddy Buggy. This cart has the highest acceleration boost of the game, and comes with a handling bonus as well. Coupled with the roller wheels and any glider that boosts acceleration, and these were my final stats for my later attempts. Next is the controls. Obviously, 200cc has racers going much faster than normal, so there are some adjustments you'll have to make to account for this. For starters, you shouldn't aim to get as many speed boosts as possible, whether it's from a jump, a spin boost pillar, or a fellow racer. This isn't to say boosts are bad, in some cases, they are perfectly safe. There's just a time and a place for them now. There can also be cases where you build up a mini turbo, but another turn is coming up. Releasing the mini turbo will have you hit the wall or fly off the edge. A simple trick is to quickly let go of the acceleration button before releasing the drift button. You'll drop the mini turbo and can immediately start the next drift without needing to compensate for extra speed. Another tip I have is to start your drifts earlier than you expect. Trying to start a drift in the corner caused a lot of wall hits, close calls, and even falls for me. I found it's much better to begin drifts at some point before the turns and adjust on the fly. The most important control to consider is braking. Some corners are simply impossible to take at top speed, so racers will have to tap or even hit the brakes for a second while drifting to make it. This is a technique called brake drifting, and with the right timing, racers can prevent a slide while still building up a mini turbo. Don't brake too much though, or you'll lose it. You must learn how to perform this technique to become efficient at 200cc. Braking can also help if you end up getting a speed boost you didn't want. I cannot express how much the brake button saved me during my challenge attempts. And now, let's talk about the tracks. Every track has its quirks, whether it's the turns, obstacles, walls, or lack thereof, shortcuts, etc. Knowing what to expect from each track can stop you from making brash or downright stupid decisions. This is the main focus of this video. We'll be going through each track as if we were running my challenge. Depending on the track, we'll discuss the overall feel, information for certain sections based on my experience, what was responsible for ending my runs, and maybe some highlights. I want to be clear, this is not a guide on how to do each track most efficiently. This is more a guide so you can beat the CPUs, or your buddies whom you invited over for a fun game night. You won't become an expert, but you'll definitely be better than your friend Eddie. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe comes with 48 tracks, with a challenge starting on Mario Kart Stadium and finishing with Big Blue. For this video, the courses will be separated into 5 sections. The first one contains the first three cups, 
and I call it the warm-up. This section gave me the most trouble in my first 10 runs, but was a breeze as I gained more experience. Eventually, these tracks were simply races for me to get in my groove, hence the name, the warm-up. As I said before, the challenge starts with Mario Kart Stadium, the typical easy first course. No matter what run I was on, this track was how I settled myself in for my attempt and gauged who my rivals would be. The only notable part is the dash panels and ramps after the glide portion. Don't bother taking these, as an inside turn is probably quicker. Next is Water Park, which focuses on showing off the game's anti-gravity and spin boost mechanics. The underwater cups area has a few tight turns that you can drift through for mini turbos if you want, but driving straight is also an option. The Ferris wheel may seem like something to avoid, but you can actually smash through the ride cars without any consequences. Not knowing this detail ended attempt two. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Yep, there we go. Yep, already fucked it up. I fucking felt her right there. Yeah. Sweet Sweet Canyon is where the real danger of failing my challenge begins. The track has a few open gaps to slip through, as well as a twisting anti-gravity section with no walls. This anti-gravity section splits into a pink and blue path, each with slightly different turns, views, and exits into the final turn. Neither one felt faster than the other to me, so your best bet is to master one and stick to it. For me, that was the pink path. Although, this was after I slipped through a gap on it in attempt 4. Oh. Yep. Quamp Ruins is the final course of the Mushroom Cup and is the first course with real obstacles. The open water area has three directions to go, but I highly recommend driving through the water. While there are more obstacles here, the sides are just straight up slower, so learning how to navigate through the water is more efficient. The complicated part of this track is the final third. Two thwomps guard the center of the track, and they're quite easy to collide with if you aren't paying attention. Don't let them distract you from the race, however. Otherwise, you'll end up like I did in attempt five. Okay, come on, come on, come on. No! Are you kidding me? <sighs> there is also a notable shortcut off a fallen pillar to the left of the glide ramp. It's tricky to pull off, so maybe don't try it without extensive practice like I did in attempt one. No! Ah. Uh... Yep, I thought I'd take the risk, but there it is. The Flower Cup starts with the straightforward Mario Circuit. The track is just a figure eight that overlaps on itself, making racers run through the loop twice per lap. As long as you use the large corners to build up mini turbos, avoid the Goombas, and only use jumps if needed, you should be fine. However, if you want to be a true racer, you must use the final glide to smash the sign at the end. This is not up for debate. Gone? Yes, sir. Next is Toad Harbor. While seemingly tight and a bit frantic, this track is one I found to be really easy once you understand it. To start things off, don't go to the boat ramp. You will drown. You'll then be taken through a lovely market where you can drive over the market tents or boost through a dash panel or stay on the ground and hug the wall because it's the quickest way through. Coming out of the market is a lower path and an upper path. The lower path is a winding S that is good for sequencing mini turbos. The upper path leads you to a ramp that jumps you through a shorter but narrow route, both viable if taken advantage of correctly. And at the end of the slope, there is an option of a tight turn to get to a dash panel, but it requires a bit of braking to get to it, so it doesn't feel worth it. Twisted Mansion doesn't lie with its name, as the course contains many tight corners that come one after another. This is the first course where brake drifting is needed for a smooth run. Halfway through, the track splits in two, with both options providing a different glide jump towards two doorways. From my experience, the left path was better for reaching the bottom doorway, while the right path was better for reaching the top. The bottom doorway is a long, wide turn up a flight of stairs. The top doorway is a short, tight turn that is flat. Whatever you decide, always be prepared for the hammer statues waiting at the exit. Attempt 3 showed what happens when you aren't. No! <sighs> of course. I knew it. I could feel it. Oh, and my camera goes fuzzy, of course. Don't take this last turn for granted. It can slip you up even after you've gained experience. I had a surprise end to attempt 41 here because I lost focus and paid the price. 
Okay. 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 Yeah, I, um... I just choked. Fuck. I, I'm off my game. I think I have to stop. Running off the flower cup is Shy Guy Falls. Of all the warm-up tracks, I would argue this is the most stressful, since there are so many places for everything to go wrong. For starters, while I have no evidence of this, the dirt portions of the track felt more slippery. If this is true, you'll want to favor the brake button a bit more and start drifting even more early. Attempt 10 ended here because I didn't account for the lower grip. Oh, okay, and uh, that's it. I I can't do this. Yeah, no. Off the glide ramp, you can take a high or low path. At 200cc, the high path's only purpose is to mess up anyone foolish enough to take it. However, the low path still provides a risk of falling off if you land wrong. Finally, the last turn has two jumps. The key is to not perform tricks off them, as you're almost certainly going to slam into the wall. I think this is a perfect time to mention some CPU behavior. Something I observed while racing is if there's an opportunity to perform a trick, the CPUs will almost always take it, even if it's detrimental to them. Now, if you set the CPUs to hard, they're more likely to recover or even benefit from performing a trick in a place that you might not be able to. Keep this idea in mind though, because this behavior can result in your opponents making mistakes for you to capitalize on. This is exactly how I beat Shy Guy Falls the first time. Let's go! Let's go! Oh! The Star Cup is the back end of the warm-up section. Sunshine Airport can seem intimidating at first, but there's only one area that's tricky. After the first plane, try to take the ramp into the next plane. If you manage this, your only problem is a tight turn. If you miss this jump, you'll have to dodge around multiple plane wheels, which is tougher but doable. Just be careful not to lose control like I did in attempt 20. Okay, I guess I, I told you I was gonna end in a stupid way. There's that run for today. <laughs> there is also a luggage conveyor belt at the end of the course. With the right timing and angle, hitting a jump off it will give you a great boost heading into the next lap. There is a risk in this, as a misaligned jump usually results in a box or wall slam. Attempt 34 also ended on this track. I couldn't place it on a particular reason other than I made a couple of mistakes and the CPU left me no room to make up the distance. Baby, come back! Baby, come back! Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Oh, are you kidding me?! Are you serious?! Never mind, I made a small mistake and I wasn't allowed to recover. <laughs> oh, the sanity's starting to go. Oh, the sanity's starting to go. Dolphin Shoals is known for two things the ability to trick off pipes onto a giant eel, and the killer saxophone in the soundtrack. The underwater section requires racers to use air currents from pipes to cross a gap. There are multiple ways to achieve this, such as pulling back on the steering stick to glide across in one jump. Attempts 6 and 7 ended because I didn't know how to do this. Wait. And it's immediately fucked. Never mind, I spoke too soon. <laughs> but yeah, I just want to be able to do, like, whatever. I, And that's hard to, you know, start up on YouTube doing. Are you fucking kidding me? <sighs> Piss off. Alright, I can stop now. The hardest part, however, is the final turn. The end of the course is incredibly windy, which is emphasized in 200cc. In my earlier runs, I tried taking the track normally, but that caused some complications. The best example comes from the end of attempt 9. Humanity is dead! It didn't take me long to find a solution. The entire section can be avoided with the glide ramp. Pulling back with a steering stick here will keep you flying for quite a bit, which allows you to glide around the corner, over the tight turns, and straight into the finish line. Electrodome is a pretty easy course to race, but that also means it's easy for the CPU. The only notable section is a track split between a green and a pink path. Personally, I found the green path easier, but while double-checking my info, 
I discovered the pink path was more preferred by players, especially speedrunners. It is quite possible my taking the green path is the reason why my opponents were constantly on my ass during multiple attempts. Hell, attempt 15 failed because my opponents sped ahead of me, made no mistakes, and nothing I did would let me catch up. What?! Are you kidding me?! This is one of the few courses I encourage you to take any boost you can get. Spin boost pillars, ultra mini turbos, and any trick jump that's available? Take it. The last course of the Star Cup is Mount Wario. The track travels down a mountain, with the laps being three different sections. There's a very sharp turn coming out of the cave, and with the speed in 200cc, it's almost impossible to hit unless you start to drift in the air. This will give you the traction needed to make the turn. I have no advice for the trees. I recommend not getting the boosts over the logs, as they increase your chance of slamming headfirst into a trunk. I made this mistake in attempt 22, and it threw me off so much I couldn't recover. Oh my god, why? Why? What? Yoshi! Yoshi! This is absolutely no- Yoshi! Oh my god, no, I've lost. Yeah. Fuck! What was that? What the fuck was happening there? After that, it's all about timing your drifts correctly. Snow and ice courses are more slippery than usual, so similar to Shy Guy Falls, you'll need to start your drifts even sooner than usual. You can also rely on your brakes, but then you risk losing too much speed like I did in attempt 8. This ends the warm-up section, and hopefully it was a good one, as next is the challenge's first big obstacle, the Special Cup. The Special Cup contains four tough tracks that required my full concentration during challenge attempts. Attempt 11 was my first time reaching this point, and it wasn't until attempt 19 that I made it through successfully. Beginning with Cloudtop Cruise, this track in the sky has you driving over bumpy clouds, a cargo-covered ship, and through a deadly lightning storm. After the first turn, you'll see a mushroom you can bounce off of for a boost, but be sure you're taking it straight on if you go for it. Attempts 13 and 14 were both lost here because I didn't have the right approach. Are you fucking kidding me? Are you actually fucking kidding me? It doesn't really matter which direction you go around the mast, just be aware of the crate locations to avoid colliding with them or the walls. Don't be discouraged if you keep messing up here. I couldn't get it consistently either. The storm section is easy enough if you pay attention to the lightning patterns and hit as many boosts as you can. Finally, I recommend not taking the leaf shortcut if you're starting out. You will most certainly fall if you haven't practiced it. The CPUs are more than happy to demonstrate its deadliness though. Next was Bone Dry Dunes. This course is here for one reason, and that's to show how difficult it is to drive on sand. Just like snow, you'll want to start your drifts early and be prepared for a lot of sliding around. These tight turns after the starting oval were my biggest struggle. I found building up regular mini turbos was the sweet spot, as anything over that usually sent me flying off course. Taking the jump boost was even worse since this resulted in full-on wall slams. For the split tracks, the left one keeps racers on the sand while avoiding some bone piranhas. That's honestly pretty gross, especially when the right track is available. Racers drive across a bunch of rib bones while gaining boosts from spin boost pillars and trick jumps. Off the ramps, I always aimed for the sand rather than the upper wooden path. I did not know this until after the challenge, but you need to bounce off this sand sprout to make it. Sure, you won't have to worry about sand, but with the right brake drift, you'll get the same speed on the ground without the worry of falling off. Despite how slick this track is, I only failed here on attempt 32, and that was for my ability to somehow mess up speed boosting. I don't understand weeb whatever bullshit. I'm not one myself. But all I notice is that it's like there's a what? <laughs> 
After that, it was this game's iteration of Bowser's Castle. This track is the absolute devil and was responsible for nine failed attempts. Just so you understand how significant this is, the tracks with the second highest number of failures had three. The first section is full of obstacles, and there's an added danger of racers colliding with you for spin boosts. Find a timing pattern that works for you and stick with it. If you get thrown off your rhythm, it's much better to slow down and reset than to scramble and try and make it work. I tried this on attempt 31 and immediately paid for it. And immediately knew it. Yep. There it is. All right. That's fine. That was my... That was really going to be a practice run no matter what. <sighs> the next portion is the deadliest. The Bowser statue will alternate slamming its fist onto the separate tracks, causing them to wiggle. If you attempt to drift while a track is wiggling, you may accidentally perform a quick trick that can send you sliding off. That's how it ended for attempts 40 and 43. Oh, fuck. No, yep. Yeah, I fucking, I should have. Whatever. Shit, why'd I do that? Damn it! There it is. Yep, I realized it last second that that was going to be a problem. All right, that's fine. Even if a path isn't wiggling, there is still the issue of colliding with your fellow racers as you navigate these narrow and wallless sections. I also lost attempts 16 and 17 here due to collisions with fellow racers throwing me off my line. Sus. Sus! Okay. No. No. Oh, I fucked it. I... I panicked. No! God damn it! I will note that neither the left nor right track is better, so I recommend getting to know them both. I originally stuck to just learning the right path, but attempt 12 showed how much of a mistake this was. Oh god, why'd I go this way? Oh boy. I can't. Damn it! After that, a glide ramp will launch you towards the final section. You'll want to take this time to line yourself up properly for the final turn. Just don't try too hard like I did in attempt 11. I'm tilting my head along with this course, that's how much it's fucking me up. After avoiding the boulders rolling around the corner, you can take either the right path straight for the finish line, or the left path that provides a ramp for a final jump boost. I failed attempts 18 and 25 here, just from mishandling this section. Oh, yeah, I'm fucked. I'm fucked. There it is. All I needed to do was not hit that rock. Fuck. Alright. If you can remember all of that, then this course is such a breeze! Finally, as with many special cups in the Mario Kart series, the last course was this game's Rainbow Road. The course designed to make all racers snap. Immediately, the first turns are tight and difficult to navigate due to the lack of walls. If you aren't confident with taking it at full speed, heavy braking and letting go of mini turbos is perfectly fine. There is also the danger of the area being anti-gravity, and the CPUs really enjoy those spin boosts. Attempt 21 ended because a poorly timed collision sent me off course. Is what I'm expecting? There it is. I fucking knew it! The space station section can be easily navigated if you avoid the ramps and try to keep your turn tight. The directions of the conveyor belts don't matter much at 200cc. For the split tracks, there being no walls is actually a benefit here, because it allows for racers to jump between them. This creates the potential for shortcuts, like this one that I used consistently for my attempts. You won't get another Rainbow Road like this, so take advantage of it. Once the special cup is complete, we can relax, but only a little. The next 12 courses aren't exactly cakewalks. This third section I call speed bumps, and it contains the shell, banana, and leaf cups. These courses aren't particularly the worst, but 
Like a speed bump, they can be a bit dicey if you take them fast or recklessly. First is Moo Moo Meadows, a pretty straightforward course. Avoid the cows, try not to drive on the grass too much, and it's one of the few courses I'd encourage as many jump boosts as possible. Hell, you can make it over the grass patches easily enough with the right amount of speed. Just like Electrodome though, the course being simple means it's easy for the CPUs. I temp 33 ended here because I made a couple of minor mistakes, and that was enough for my foes. Oh, well, I'm dead. I've lost. Because I psyched myself out. Yeah, that's it. It's over. And let's... No! Damn it. Thank God, okay? I hate that. That was awful. Next is Mario Circuit from the Game Boy Advance. The only strange section of the course is the anti-gravity U-turn. More specifically, the ramp off of it. There's not much room once you hit the ground, so your best bet is to start your drift in the air. This will have you start drifting as soon as you land and makes getting around the corner much easier. Also, the detour before the finish line is never worth it. It needs a dash panel to be the same speed as a straight line. Cheap Cheap Beach is mainly a bumpy drive over the sand, but you can also drive through shallow water. I highly recommend avoiding the deep blue sea though. In a nice change of pace, you can safely perform tricks off all of the ramps. However, you should always be aware of tree and crab locations, as racing in 200cc will make last second avoidance tricky and possibly time consuming. Rounding out the Shell Cup is Toad's Turnpike. This track appears simple like the other three, but the major factor of this course, the traffic, can make all of the difference. First off, don't bother to drive on the walls or take the glide ramps off of cars. None of them will be as fast as sticking to the highway. Now for the traffic. At the start of the race, the track will randomly decide if the traffic moves in alternating directions or just moves forward. If you're driving with alternating traffic, you'll have a much easier time against the CPUs. Sure, you can accidentally collide head-on with a bus going around a corner, but you can risk building up mini turbos and trust the CPUs will make more mistakes. The harder version, ironically, is when the traffic is driving in the same direction as you. At this point, throw everything I just said out the window and simply drive in the inner lane. Do not drift. Do not swerve. Don't do anything but stay in the inner lane. Personally, I collided with traffic while attempting drifts much more often when traffic was going the same way, and one mistake is all it took for the CPUs to run away with the race. In my failed attempts, I went through this course 14 times. Five times the traffic was going in alternating directions, and I never lost an attempt. Of the other nine, I lost three times. Attempt 19. No! Gotta take it. Gotta take it. Oh my god! I said it! I spoke it into existence! Attempt 23. Oh no, I'm stupid again. God damn it! Okay, so we found a new problem course. An attempt 37. <sighs> Thing is, I knew it was gonna happen too. I was like, I had to take a risk. The banana cup begins with dry, dry desert. As we now know, sand is a pain to drive on so another reminder to start drifting earlier. However, you can be a bit looser on this course. For example, I drove straight for the obelisks once they collapsed into ramps, as it's quicker than trying to make the slippery turns work around the pokies. You can also cut straight through the sandpit if you enter at the correct angle. The last turn has a fallen obelisk to boost off of as well, but only take this if you're certain you won't fly off the path. Donut Plains 3 can only be described as wet. While there is no way to go out of bounds, it's very easy to skid onto the grass or into the walls. Brake drifting is needed to run laps cleanly. You'll also want to keep an eye out for the moles. They seem like a minor nuisance, but they'll catch you off guard if you aren't paying attention. Their holes can also provide a quick trick boost. Royal Raceway is how I would describe Princess Peach in Smash Bros, a sweet exterior covering a few devilish tricks. The first turn feels safe until you activate your mini turbo and almost fly off into the water. Letting go of your mini turbo for this corner is perfectly fine. The other thing to think of is the hot air balloons. When you hit the glide ramp, you'll notice a toad has parked his hot air balloon along the glide path. 
Now, usually the Mushroom Boy will float on the sides, thus being out of your way. On the off chance he decides to park right in the middle of the track, be ready to swerve around and land quickly to account for his inconsideration. Stupid little mushroom f DK Jungle, appropriately, is the final track of the Banana Cup. You'll definitely want to remain focused on this course, as it's very easy to lose control. Off the bat, be cautious when driving around the tree, as a bad angle or bump off its roots can send you flying off the sides, as I did in attempt 24. Yep, I called it. Yep, I immediately got fucked. Well, there is an elevated glide ramp in the canopy, but it requires almost a perfect angle to not lose speed because of it. Avoiding the frogs is irritating, but not a deal breaker. Coming out of the temple, you can either head down a windy water path below or fly over it. It should be pretty obvious which option is better. At the end, there's a track split. The closest path is quite tight, but shorter, while the further one is a smoother curve, but longer. The closest one is difficult, but by far the better choice if you can pull it off. The CPU sure can. Attempt 28 ended due to a last second takeover by a CPU. If I could manage that sharper turn, maybe I could have salvaged it. But I couldn't, and I paid for it. There's nothing I can do. <sighs> Thank God, you know what? I'm actually okay with it. I'm actually okay with this. You wanna know why? Because I don't have to deal with him anymore! The Leaf Cup is the last Speed Bumps Cup, and it starts with Wario Stadium. The scariest part of this track is the raised anti-gravity section, as it's the only place you can fall off, and the Spin Boost Happy CPUs certainly don't help. So have your brake button ready. Attempt 26 ended because I drifted the wrong way for just a second, but that's all it takes. No! Oh my god, there it is. Fucking, I'm trying to go right and he goes left. This is also the first time in my attempts I would utilize hopping. The track is mainly made out of dirt, so it's hard to drift around corners without hitting the walls a ton. For cases like this, simply tap the drift button while turning. The main purpose of this technique is alignment, so you won't build any mini turbos. But with this technique, you're more likely to maintain your speed and glide around corners without wall collisions. I'm fairly certain this technique has many more uses across all the courses, but it just worked best on Wario Stadium for me. Despite Sherbet Land being an ice and snow course, it gives you lots of room to start drifting early to account for traction delays. You should always watch out for any Shy Guys or Freezies on the track though, as it's easy to accidentally slide into them. If you've never run this course before, these holes guarded by pylons may alarm you. However, as I discovered on Attempt 27, they don't represent an out-of-bounds area. Oh shit! Oh! That was the biggest heart attack of my life! Yeah, these holes are just gateways to alternate pathways. I don't believe they are faster, so do try and stay on top of the ice, but there's no need to panic if you accidentally slip into a hole. Music Park's biggest danger is how goddamn groovy its soundtrack is. Avoid the black keys on any part of the track. It's better to keep to the tight corners, and on the marimba and vibraphone, going on the black keys can throw you out of bounds. The bouncing notes can either be flown over, or you can take your chances weaving around them. Be cautious if you are gliding, as you can go over the railings like I did in attempt 35. I was having... Too much fun with the music, and I bopped too hard. Fuck. There is also a tambourine at the end of the note section, which you can use to bounce towards the finish line. I never took it because... Well, I didn't notice it until I was writing this script, actually. Anyways, the final speed bump is Yoshi Valley, the famous N64 track with multiple interconnecting routes. I won't say which direction is the fastest. Truthfully, I have no clue which is. From my experience though, going left and left again around the bend and over the two drop ramps felt pretty solid. Going left and then right into a cave built up an ultra mini turbo that I like to utilize a lot in later runs. And the cannon is a complete waste of time. 
This ends the speed bump section. While a few of these courses are tricky, this is the area of the challenge where you can recharge just a bit before heading into the hell that is the Lightning Cup. While the Special Cup ended most of my runs, I still consider the Lightning Cup to be my biggest foe. Attempt 27 was the first time I reached this point, and it took until Attempt 38 to finally make it past. I knew if I could get through these four courses, then I was in the zone. Kicking it off with TikTok Clock, there are many moving pieces you'll have to track and time your drifts around. The clock hands can give you additional trick boosts, but they are a bit tricky, so I preferred to avoid them. Halfway through, you'll have the choice of gliding around or driving through a set of rotating gears. I preferred to glide, as I had trouble navigating the switching directions due to 200cc's high speeds. However, driving over the gears can give you a series of trick jumps, so it's really up to your comfort level. You can get an additional boost at the end by hitting the forward rotating gear. Make sure you are lined up correctly though, as you risk launching yourself into the abyss if you aren't. Gears also switch direction every 45 seconds, which you'll want to remember so you aren't caught off guard. Piranha Plant Slide is an incredibly fast course through the Mushroom Kingdom's underground. The brake button is your best friend for this one. The path with the shallow water eventually opens to a large piranha plant and long holes in the center. It's just a matter of aiming for the sides to avoid these. Which is easier said than done. The middle of the course is a zigzag with a couple of pipes on the ground. This is not the place to get fancy or perform tricks. Taking this corner slowly is perfectly fine, as even drifting through here can be difficult. I tried to do so during attempt 36, and it backfired horribly. Ah, oh, no, I should have done the hops. I realized it too late when I was doing it. I fucking am stupid. The glide out of the underground is the steepest in the game, but you can still fly for a short bit. That being said, if you want the most control possible for the final turn, land as soon as you can. Grimmel Volcano is notorious for having sections of the track fall away as the race progresses. Any breakaway sections are outlined by cracks on the path, and in a typical race, they will have all fallen by the third lap. Attempt 29 ended because, apparently, half the damn course being gone wasn't enough for me to be careful. Still appears best. No! Oh. Fuck. This course has a large number of split paths to consider. The first ones in the volcano are very similar. They both have the same turns, but the left one is a bit tighter. Immediately after, there's a glide ramp and a regular ramp that lead out to a section with two side paths. This may be tempting due to the dash panels at the end, but I feel confident in saying they are more like detours in 200cc and are best to be avoided. The final split has a lower right path that provides two ramps to perform tricks off of and an upper right path that provides a glide ramp. I found the left path is better suited for newer racers like myself, while the right path becomes faster once you're more experienced in 200cc. Finally, we have another Rainbow Road. And this time it's from the N64. Similar to Mount Wario, the laps are three separate sections of the course. As you would expect, the track has many areas with limited to no walls, but the turns aren't all that difficult if you can drift decently. The first section has many boosts that should all be taken, and a rippling area with a chain chomp. Bouncing off the ripples can give a small boost, but avoiding the chain chomp should be your first priority. The second section has two wide turns separated by another wiggling area with more bouncing chain chomps. Again, avoid the chomps at all costs, but take the boost if it's safe to do so. The final section has multiple turns before finishing with two boosts and a glide ramp. I struggled a lot on this final turn, and attempts 27 and 30 ended from my failure to understand the best way through. No, there it is. Yeah, I knew it. Those things always scare me. Ugh. In all honesty, you can probably make it with correctly timed drifts, but I eventually found my own way on attempt 38. By no means is this the best method, but it's the one I won off of. Oh! 
Wow! Keep it simple! Who needs to be good at drifting when you can just let go of the accelerator? Certainly not this guy. If you've survived the Lightning Cup, that means you'll be two-thirds of the way to victory. However, there is no more room to relax, no chance to catch your breath, as you'll now be in the home stretch, or as I like to call it, the racer's gauntlet. The racer's gauntlet contains the remaining 16 courses from Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, and any one of them has a good possibility of ending my challenge. Well, almost any one of them. Many of these courses require you to have specific paths in mind before starting, and those that don't require a strong ability to improvise. Of my 43 failed attempts from this challenge, only three made it to this section. Attempt 38, Attempt 39, and Attempt 42. Because of this, you may see footage from practice runs from now on. The gauntlet begins with the Egg Cup and its first course, Yoshi Circuit. The name is quite literal, as it's a track that runs along the edge of a Yoshi-shaped island. You can only fall off the left side, so don't be afraid to hug the right wall to avoid slipping into the sea. The only trick I found involved the three small turns that make up Yoshi's head spikes. In 200cc, you can just drive behind the first piranha plant, since the grass won't slow you down all that much. You can also jump over the grass if you want, but this will increase the risk of losing control. Excite Bike Arena is a giant oval where the jump, ramp, and mud locations are all randomized. Despite this, there are a few things to always keep in mind. The mud spots on the turns are either on the sides and in the middle, or zigzag in their locations. If you see a flat platform on the left, take it. You'll avoid a mud pit on the right. Speaking of mud, avoid it at all costs. No trick or mini turbo is going to let you zoom through that stuff. Driving over the grass can be fine with a boost, but it's not recommended. And be smart with your tricks. Spamming the trick button on this course is fun, but a poorly angled jump can have muddy consequences. Dragon Driftway's gimmick is the twisting nature of it. At certain points during the race, the track rotates 90 degrees to the left or right. While these areas aren't too confusing, they can be a bit disorientating, so it's best not to get too crazy when these transitions happen. Almost the whole track is anti-gravity as well, but try not to collide with your competitors just for an extra boost. You're more than likely to hit a wall, or worse. The section with the spin boost pillars is an exception to this suggestion. Finishing off the Egg Cup is the ever-speedy Mute City. Like Dragon Driftway, most of the track is anti-gravity and windy, but overall, it's not as confusing. First off, coins are only gathered off the blue and purple pit areas on the side, so fill that up quickly. Also, the boost pads in this section of the course are randomized, so use the first lap to memorize their locations, and then hit as many as you can in later laps. Be extra vigilant on this curve, as the entire left side and a good portion of the right have no walls, and it's hard to see where the drop-off point is. There are a few turns at the end, but these can actually be skipped off the ramp down. Perform a trick off of it, and then pull back on the steering stick. Your car will float down to the end, and because you performed a trick, you'll get an additional boost once you land. Wario's Gold Mine starts off the Triforce Cup. The first major hurdle appears about halfway through the course with a slanted ramp. You need to be precise to make a clean jump off. Too far left, you hit the wall. Too far right, and you'll have what ended attempt 38. No! Yeah, there it is, I knew it. This one... <sighs> the track splits shortly after that point, with the minecarts being carried up to the left. This path has boost pads and is decently straight, but at the fast speeds, it's insanely risky and not really worth it. The right path also gives a better setup for a long drift into the next lap. Also, don't try and fight the bats. You will lose. Surprisingly, the next course is the game's third Rainbow Road, with this one being the famous absolutely no walls whatsoever SNES version. For this one, there are just a few general rules. Rule number one, watch the thwomps. This should be obvious, but knowing when they'll slam or which one won't is key and can be easily forgotten. Rule number two, avoid any ramps. A good run of this course won't need them and they aren't even in good positions to be counted on for catching up. And rule number three, watch out for your opponents. There's not much room on the track, and as seen on attempt 39, being behind your opponent is no safer than being beside them. Just commit, just commit, just commit. No! Ugh! 
FUCKING DO THAT! Unlike many tracks that have the occasional branching paths, Ice Ice Outpost gives racers two at all times, and I recommend learning them both. There are also places where you can switch which one you're driving on. It's actually recommended to drive on green, then switch to yellow, and then back to green to get the quickest laps. But I am backwards and strange, cause I did yellow, green, yellow. Hey, it was working for me! There are also two side bits in the ice cave that racers can use. Truthfully, I'm not sure how effective they are, but they can be your saving grace if you fall off the course. Especially if you don't know they were there! Cave line does not- What just... wait, what? It should be no surprise that the final course in the Triforce Cup is Hyrule Castle. While the switch from coins to rupees is charming, the course is anything but. The stairs into the castle lead to a grand hall with roots swerving around the Master Sword. There is a secret to this part. If all three spin boosts leading down are hit, a hidden ramp appears for racers to fly into the legendary weapon. Once again, I did not know about this until the magic Google machine told me. But personal experience showed driving around the Master Sword wasn't slow, especially when you can cut down on the final turns by boosting over the grass. Speaking of the final turns, take the lower left path. It may be the outside line, but you avoid a Deku Babas and don't risk slipping off a small ledge if you do so. Moving on to the Crossing Cup, we have the classic Baby Park. The trick to this track is to... Uh... Drive good, I guess? Cheese Land is our third desert track of the challenge, and it is just as irritating as the other two. Notably, the track is covered with holes, which you can treat like you would potholes. Avoid at all costs, or you will feel pain. The most notable part of the track is the two chain chumps that attempt to attack the racers. The first one is right after a glide ramp, so landing early will have you sailing safely underneath. The second one can also be safely avoided by staying on the left, which is out of its range. Another way to avoid the second chain chomp is by taking this glide ramp off to the side. If you do, avoid the second chain chomp like you did the first one. You do need to traverse the sand to get to it though, and I didn't figure out how to do this efficiently, so that risk is up to you. Wildwoods' first note for the course comes from, you guessed it, a track split! The left gives coins and is the safer one to take. The right provides two extra ramps for trick boosts, but these come with the risk of falling off. If you're learning 200cc, be extra vigilant on this boardwalk. There are holes everywhere to slip through. The stream running down the tree provides enough of a boost that tricking off the ramps there is more of a detriment. There is also a side ramp at the end of the course that can be taken to skip the final turn, but it's another detour that requires you to be very precise. Taking the last turn is not a major loss. Crossing Cup's final course is the season-changing Animal Crossing. This course randomly selects one of the four seasons for racers to run through, each with its own small variations. Spring will give you many ramps, but the only one worth taking is the one in front of the finish line. Summer gives the beach a couple of ramps, but I would only suggest tricking off the first one in 200cc. Autumn just gives leaf piles that would contain items if they weren't turned off. Winter is the hardest variation, as it makes the entire track snowy. As we know, snow is slippery like sand. You know the drill. Start your drifts earlier than expected! Yes! Good job! The Bell Cup is the final set of courses in the challenge, and each one will push you to your limits. First, we have the rainy roads of Neo Bowser City. Have you ever driven on wet roads? Yeah, it sucks, and this track encapsulates that perfectly. Treat the track like you're driving on ice. There is a tight, no-barrier section a third of the way through, You'll need perfect timing to be able to drift and use mini turbos here. If you're like me, you won't have that, so brake drifting and dropping those boosts is the strategy. Losing speed is fine since the remaining portion of the track has multiple spin boost pillars and a glide ramp, all of which you're safe to boost off of. You can even glide over the finish line if you desire, but landing earlier is recommended. Second, we have the wiggly paths of Ribbon Road. This course's middle section is incredibly tricky, with no walls and a path that bounces up and down at times. This is reminiscent of the wiggly paths in Bowser's Castle, where a badly timed drift can send you heading off the side. To avoid this, pay attention to where the path will shift up and down. Time your drifts to start the moment these areas end. 
The rows don't have much grip, so slam that brake button if you come anywhere close to the yellow border. This course was responsible for the end of my furthest attempt, attempt 42. All it took was one misaligned jump off a ramp. Okay. And I did something crazy. Third, we have the very enclosed Super Bell Subway. Despite being cramped, this course is packed with multiple routes to drive, all while subway trains run back and forth. To break it down, racers can either risk the train tracks or drive on narrow raised paths that end with jumps. These higher areas should allow racers to ride across and or avoid the trains, and they do provide speed boosts. But personally, I never had issues driving next to or around the trains. There's ramps for you to trick off of, and it was much easier to drift with such a wide path. I'd say practice both, so you're prepared for wherever your cart takes you. No need to trick up the stairs, unless you want to slam face first into a wall. <laughs> and finally, to round out the bell cup, the gauntlet, and the whole challenge, we have a legendary course in F-Zero's Big Blue. Just like Mount Wario and the N64's Rainbow Road, this is one straight path with three sections. The first section starts with dash panels and pit areas before leading to multiple alternating conveyor belts. As I said for this game's Rainbow Road, these don't make much of a difference unless you stick to one belt for more than a few seconds. The second section is a giant water slide that splits in two and then rejoins near the end. There are many areas of this section with no walls, which allows racers to jump between the paths and even skip over areas if they're skilled enough, which I was not. The last section gives racers their final track split of the challenge, with much fewer chances to switch between the two paths. Any open gaps are hard to pull off, so I suggest picking a path and mastering it. Once they merge up, it's a smooth ride to the end. As I said at the start, I failed this challenge over 40 times, with attempt 42 being my farthest. I was two courses short of victory. After that attempt died, I was absolutely crushed. So much so that it was the only attempt I ran that day. I knew I wouldn't be able to get back into the right mindset. So I ended the stream early. My life got a bit busy, then the holidays came, and then the next thing I knew, it had been a month since I last streamed. I seriously considered if it was worth trying to run the challenge again. I knew people were getting sick of seeing the same courses over and over and over. Hell, I was too. I didn't know if I had another run like a 1042 in me, and maybe the month away had made me incredibly rusty. Was I ready to do another 40 runs of this random challenge I made? Well, as it turns out, I was. In my second stream back, I booted up the game, grabbed my controller, and got back to it. A 1043 was a good warm up, with it ending on the ever irritating Bowser's Castle. And as attempt 44 got underway, I saw something that changed everything. Oh god! Oh, this is my worst nightmare! 